morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay at the back? Is the microphone working okay? Just for cameras. Oh, is it okay? Cool. Uh, so, for those that don't know me, uh, I'm Chloe Wong and I'm a postdoc that works in John Mills' uh, epigenetics group at King's College London. My main research interest is to explore DNA methylation differences in, uh, in autis uh, autism spectrum disorder as well as uh, the role of DNA methylation in explaining phenotypic differences in twins. In this talk, I would like to bring your attention to our new uh, R package for the analysis of 450k data called Watermelon. Some of you might have heard of it already. Uh, before I go on, I'd like to first thank the organiser for giving me the opportunity to speak here today. Before I go into details of uh, the rationale behind this project, I'd like to acknowledge two of my co uh, colleagues at King's College London, uh, Leo Shockwick and Ruth Pisley. Apart from eating a lot of watermelon together, we also spend a lot of time working quite hard on this package together. So as you heard from Christoph already, uh, the 450k array is a very useful addition to the available methods for DNA methylation. But it's complex design which incorporates two different types of probes, which harbors quite a different distribution. Means that we need to take in quite a lot of careful consideration when it comes to data, normal data normalization and data analysis. So a good standard way to uh, correct for background uh, effect for expression arrays uh, is quantile normalization, which has been well tested for uh, data in uh, gene expression arrays and also SNP arrays. It also has been widely applied to 450k betas. So quantile normalization is a rank-based transformation method which seeks to eliminate the low levels background noise that are present on any microarrays. It preserves quantitative information when the arrays are comparable and retains the differences between the separate values and results in identical distribution for each array. However, in parts of the distribution with very little values, uh, which means that there are not many, many probes on, on those dist distribution, quantile normalization might introduce considerable changes. So with this caveat, as well as the complex design of the 450k array, uh, we ended up with quite a list of questions when we came to first analysing the data that we obtained from our experiments. Some of the questions we had is whether quantile normalisation reduces unwanted variance or is it actually counterproductive? Can type 1 and type 2 probes be made comparable by equalising the difference in distribution? But do so without destroying meaningful information. Is it better to normalise type 1 and 2 probes separately or together? Does it help to adjust for uh, dye bias, so normalise green, red against green? And does it help to split the data by probe or target characteristics? Before we get a bit too obsessive about it, we thought it would be useful to actually highlight what we want to achieve first. So in our group, our primary approach to microanalysis is to try to maximise the sensitivity for detection of differences between experimental group. And the accuracy of estimation of absolute methylation fraction, if any, is secondary. So we have two main desired outcomes from doing pre-processing steps, which is to get rid of unwanted technical variants which will help us to improve sensitivity to detect more true differences between experimental groups. <coughs> now that we know what we want to test and what we want to achieve, we need to find some matrix that can evaluate the performance of different pre-processing steps, essentially. We're lucky in working in the field of uh, DNA methylation where we have natural controls essentially, which are sites with a clear expectation of a defined partial methylation level. And I'm going to go into each of them in details. So the first of these is provided by genome imprinting. Uh, imprinted genes are expressed monoallelically and marked by allele-specific parent of origin dependent methylation at discrete imprinted differentially methylated regions, so IDMRs. Stable IDMRs have been characterised for 25 human imprinting regions, 
where one would expect monoallelic, therefore 50% methylation, so having a beta value of around 0 0.5. There are 237 uh, DIDMR probes on the array that lie within a conservative set of defined IDMRs. And we der derived a value which resembled a standard error on, uh, on these 237 IDMR probes. And uh, we compared this value, uh, which obtained from different pre-processing step, and uh, look at method, which uh, reduced the variance. So it gives a tighter peak around the expected regions. We think that it performs better. We named this matrix DMRSC, stand for differentially methylated regions <coughs> standard error. On the 450K array, there are 65 control probes, which assay highly polymorphic SNPs rather than DNA methylation. <coughs> They're very useful because they allow sample quality control, so allow you to check for relatedness between individuals and detection of potential sample mix-ups. The signals from these SNP probes are expected to cluster into three distinct groups, depending on the genotype, so whether the individuals is heterozygous or homozygous for each SNPs. The distribution of these peaks could provide an indication of the degree of technical variance between samples. We used k-mean clustering to partition the data into these three clusters. And for each SNP, we calculate the sum of squares and the number of samples per cluster. In an ideal world where there's absence of technical variance, uh, it should result in zero width peaks. We captured this across multiple probes and derived a value which resemble a standard error for each of the three cluster for each SNP. And uh, at the end, to simplify interpretation, these three measures were combined into a single value by taking the mean. And this matrix is referred to as GCOS, stand for Genotype Combined Standard Error. X chromosome inactivation in female provide us with another set of loci that demonstrate predictive patterns of DNA methylation, as one copy of the X chromosome in female is predominantly inactivated and largely methylated due to, due to this phenomenon. But since we know that the value of DNA methylation across active X chromosome sites varies, we do not expect uniform X chromosome hemimethylation. However, we do expect male and female differences when you have a study where you have both sexes, where females showing at least 50% methylation at CTGC <coughs> site on the X chromosome, which are influenced by X chromosome activation, and the male substantially less. So we conducted a receiver operating characteristic analysis, so a rock analysis, using the t-test p-value for sex difference as a predictor of X chromosome. Uh, and on the 450K array, we identify uh, over 11,000 of uh, these X chromosome probes. The area under the curve, so OG, provides an estimate of the performance of the predictor that ranges from 0.5 for an equal chance to 1 for a predict, uh, perfect predictor. So closer, the preprocessing method that gives you a value closer to 1 means that it performed the best. We used 1 minus arc as a matrix, so just to flip it across, which means that the smaller value we get means that the performance has improved. And this matrix we named Seabird, which is named after the arc and also the mythical rock. If you haven't seen it, this is an arc going out for a walk. <laughs> so armed with these three performance matrices, we decided to test our 15 different pre-processing methods, which include just raw betas, quantile normalization of betas. Uh, we also included uh, methods from f uh, three published, data, uh, published uh, papers from uh, TOST, uh, the p-correction from TOST, uh, and from Fuchs and Swan as well. We also thought we'll try out 10 different combination of pre-processing uh, pre methods. <coughs> so for these 10 methods over here, we have used a naming convention that encodes key aspects of each method. So these three methods here. And files were added in just so that it's easier to pronounce. 
The first letter, so the first column, indicates whether background adjustment has been performed with D meaning yes and N being no. The third letter, so the second column, indicate whether between sample quantumization of methylated and methylated have been performed, with T meaning uh, the quantum normalization have been performed for M and U together, as for separately, and M being no. And uh, the fifth letter, so the fourth, third column here, indicates whether die bias correction has been performed, uh, which is the quantum normalization of M against U for type 1 and 2 probes for T being together for type 1 and 2 probes and S being separately and N being no. We then use a total of 11 data set, which comprise of both brain and blood data, to test which preprocessing methods give the best result from our three performance matrices. So as you remember, the IDMR, SNP and X chromosome probes. Just to give you a feel of what actually happened during the, the method, we don't need to, uh, uh, in the method, uh, here's an example of a uh, ranking method for one of the cohort on the type 1 probes. So we first calculate the matrix score, the uh, IDMR, the free genotype, and the X chromosome for each of the 15 preprocessing methods from wall all the way to swan. And for each preprocessing method, we took the mean of the free SNP score to generate just one SNP score. For each of the free matrix, we ranked the preprocessing methods. And for each of the preprocessing methods, we then calculate the free ranked matrix. So essentially, at this step, it gives you the best preprocessing methods suitable for cohort 1BC for type 1 probes. But since we are interested in learning which methods was the best across all our, our 11 data set, for each of the preprocessing methods, we calculate the mean ranks across all the data set, so all the data set down here, for type 1 and type 2 probes separately. We then rank the mean matrix uh, values across all the data set to give us a final winner, essentially, that we think was best for both type 1 and type 2 probes across all of our 11 data set. So the, data, uh, the winner that we got is a method called DASON, which involves background adjustment of the methylated and the methylated intensity, and followed by separate quantile normalization of methylated and unmethylated type 1 and type 2 intensity separately as well. In our hand, we, uh, we've been successful in verifying the findings using an other independent platform. <coughs> and in this case, we use Power Sequencer. Forgive me that I can't give you too much detail about this project because it's uh, data yet to be published. In this project, we use case control uh, approach using postmortem brain tissue. And uh, this is an example A here. So uh, 450 gate data and validation using power sequencing. We observed. Uh, we replicate the uh, significant case control differences. And same here for another probe in the data set. And for a different project where we took a uh, discordant twin <coughs> design uh, using buccal cell DNA, we also managed to uh, replicate two of the top hits so far. So after all the fun and time that we spent investigating which preprocessing method suit our data the best, we thought that will we'll be nice and share what we've done so far and put our scripts together and uh, make a program called Watermelon, which gives a very convenient access to the performance matrix that I outlined in the talk and the different uh, lomonizer that are available in the market so far. It has a very easy workflow and uh, has a very, very detailed menu and help page as well. And if you're interested, all you have to do is type in watermelon R into Google, which gives you the first two hit. The first hit took you to the bio contactor website, which allow you to download the package and also got all the relevant R script and help pages as well. And the second hit actually gives you, take you to the uh, very comprehensive menu of the package. 
So in watermelon, uh, you can very easily apply the free performance matrix on your data after applying any type of pre-processing method of your choice, so the 15 that I outlined in my talk. Watermelon is compatible with uh, existing package, so Mathalumi, Minfi, or IMA. So it takes both final report and IDAT uh, files as well. It allows you to uh, essentially just choose what you want to use as a normalizer for your data and use our uh, performance matrix to check which one is the best. Uh, apart from the 15 that I mentioned, we've also recently added in the BMIQ from, the, uh, from Andrew Taschendorf and colleagues. So I'd like to end this talk by acknowledging all my co-authors, uh, especially uh, Ruth and Leo and John. And uh, as I mentioned before, we are actively updating our package as well. If you think that you've got a good method that you want to <coughs> talk to us about and maybe incorporate into our package, feel free to contact me. And uh, I'm happy to let you know that our paper has been recently accepted. And we're happy to share the uh, proof of the paper as well, if you're interested. And I believe John's got a few posts that are available, so please contact him if you're interested. And thank you very much. Hi, thanks for an interesting talk. I've, I've had a, been using bits of the watermelon package, um, but I've also been looking at, I've looked at the Teschendorf paper that covered the MIQ in relation to some of the other methods, and perhaps unsurprising, I guess he found, they found that, um, I think it was quantum normalization plus the MIQ came out best in their metrics. So I'm wondering, with your data sets, if you run um, the quantum normalization plus the MIQ, um, to see what it, how it performs. So on we've your actually just started trying out, but I haven't really got an answer for you yet. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, I'll, I'll ask one. Um, do you have any uh, in sort of idea of, of exactly why the method that works the best works the best? Like, what, what do you reckon is the main reason why what it's doing? Mm -hmm. I think for, in our case, uh, DASIM worked the best is partly because all of our data is actually really good quality and they're all from the same scanner. If you use data that uh, is a large collaborative project where you have data coming from different sites and different scanner, you might need to incorporate a dive bias correction. And uh, we like to market the watermelon package as a as a place for you to try it out if you like, if you're convinced with our free matrix. So these are, so Dayton is what we recommend using our 11 data set. And I wouldn't be surprised that other methods will, will work better for different types of data. Uh, I was wondering, uh, you used this um, ex accent activation and imprinting, etc. This may not be relevant for, for your analysis, but I don't think 50% methylation is actually what we are seeing. What we are seeing on deep bisulfide sequencing data is more something like like overall X and activation and all imprinted regions is more like 40-ish percent. Mm. Um, so yeah. because it seems that the regions that are unmethylated are more clearly unmethylated mm. than the regions that are methylated. So I wouldn't be too dogmatic about expecting 50%. We definitely agree with that. So for the uh, X chromosome, we didn't actually use the 50% as a way to test it. We used, uh, we tried to tease out the difference between male and females, which you should expect. So we don't actually use the 50% as a, as a way to test it. OK, uh, I think that's all we have time for, so thank you again. Thank you.